You just tuned in to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. You're going to love today's episode. And oh, by the way, we have a cool giveaway. So here's how you can qualify for the giveaway. By the way, here's the prize. If you win, you'll get some free Z-Biotics. What's Z-Biotics, you ask? This is a genetically modified probiotic drink that you drink, literally, you open it up, you drink it, before you drink alcohol. Why do you do this? The bacteria in this little bottle right here actually produce a compound in your gut that breaks down the negative byproducts of alcohol. So that means you feel okay or way better the day after versus if you had not had this to begin with. And I'm telling you right now, 100% honest to God truth, this stuff really, really does work. Look it up. Read about it yourself. It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, and today's episode is sponsored uh, by this uh, by this product uh, as well. Anyway, here's how you win the product. Go in the comments in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Leave us a comment. Tell us a funny drinking story uh, about you and your friends. Um, and as long as your comment is in the first 24 hours, Doug is going to go through, pick the best one. The best person will win a free z -Botic. Also, subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so that you can get in in the first 24 hours when we drop these podcasts to win awesome prizes. One more thing before we get started. Uh, this month, we are running a promotion on two programs and a bundle of programs, all designed to help you burn body fat and build muscle to get you ready for the warming coming months. This is a, a, a great promotion. We Actually, the first time I think we've ever put all these things on sale. They're all 50% off, which is huge. Okay, so here's the ones you get. There's MAPS HIT, which is high-intensity interval training done right. Then there's MAPS SPLIT, which is a, an advanced bodybuilding workout program. And then we have the Bikini Bundle, which includes multiple workout programs. All of them 50% off. All you got to do is go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use this code for 50% off. Spring break. All right, enjoy this podcast. You know, I have this episode that I, I want to do with you guys that I think, um, we, I don't think we've ever really covered it, it in depth for sure, but I would say, I don't know, 75% of my clients uh, asked this question at one point um, when they, they hired me as a personal trainer, and that was, Adam, how do I stay fit and not stop my wine drinking or my Sunday fun day with the girls or my occasional beer while I watch football. I love to drink. I'm not an alcoholic, but I enjoy the social side of it. I enjoy it. I don't want to, I don't want to give it up. Can I be fit and still, still do this? I got yeah. that question. Can I still party? Yeah. I, I got that question all the time. Yeah. It's uh, it's very common. Uh, I looked this up and the average American, I don't know this the average American drinks 1.3 glasses of alcohol or drinks a day mm. a day average now I, it's average and remember average is you yeah, take the still, total amount yeah divided by everybody so this means there's so some the alcohol is those skewed. outliers <laughs> just yeah. bringing that average just up. Bringing that average. <laughs> and then i looked up the top drinking countries in the world you guys want to take some guesses not ours uh, Are germany we? no yeah, i would uh, guess germany. denmark so countries that consume the most alcohol number Ireland. one lithuania oh. number two the czech republic three is germany Romania, Russia, 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 Russia beat us or something. Ah, uh, France, Belarus, Hungary, Portugal, so America is like way down the list. Believe it or not. What? Now, yeah. okay, so if you were to compare us to all those, the drinking age, I know it like Germany is like thirteen or something like that, isn't it? Eighteen. Oh, oh, is it eighteen? I, I thought well, it was I know lower. it isn't. I think I it is for. If, look up Doug uh, lowest drinking ages and tell me what they are. Yeah, I know in Italy it's eighteen, but maybe not for wine. You mm. know, I think that they treat uh, liquor. Different than wine. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think you can drink wine when you're four. No, I'm just kidding. Wow. That's just my, that was <laughs> yeah. just when I was a kid. Yeah. We had a little bit of that. Um, but yeah, we don't drink uh, as much per capita. However, I can't speak for some of those countries. I've never been there, but I did. Obviously, I've visit, visit, been to Italy oftentimes. In Italians, it's much more uh, accepted for socially. It's, like mm -hmm. it's, it's just a thing. You just have wine. Yeah, I think know, that's whatever. the main difference is just like, yeah, culturally, uh, like how, you know, people deal with it is, mm -hmm. is a bit different in like how you're raised with it, like how, you know, young it's introduced. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a lot of those factors. And, and so like... Uh, 
that was a lot of times like when I did clients, it was, you know, people from different countries or different cultural upbringing with it. It was just a part of, uh, you know, dinner was always a glass of wine, always had, you know, some kind of like alcoholic beverage uh, with every meal. Yeah. Wow. Doug just pulled up an article. I know. Crazy. That's interesting that you had Norway in there. So you had 10 Greece. countries with no minimum legal drinking age. So there is no minimum. I'm sure they will frown upon a bartender giving a 10 year old. Yeah could, yeah. could you imagine like a 12 year old <laughs> slides up to the bar? Well, you want to know what's crazy? In, in Again, in Southern Little Italy, Long Island, my, uh, my cousins would go to the would go to clubs in the summer because the summer, you know, no school or whatever. 14, 15 years old, and they would get drinks. Well, your your study guy, didn't they do a study on this or a survey on this with people that are countries that didn't have drinking ages, and they actually, there's less abuse of it, there's less it depends, alcoholism? It like, depends on how you're raised with it. So uh, and what they found is that if you're raised with uh, responsible drinking as the norm, and it's not like this big deal, mm -hmm. you're less likely to partake in binge drinking. If you raised in a household where it's like, oh no, nobody does, that's the worst thing you could possibly do, and then you go off to college, you're more likely to engage in some of those risky behaviors. And I just think you just don't learn how to, I remember the first time I, yeah. so I know I'm Italian, we didn't drink when I was a, in my household, nobody did. In fact, most of my family doesn't drink. When I go to Italy, I would see my family in Italy drink, but here I didn't, and the first time I really drank, I got way too drunk because I didn't know. I didn't mm -hmm. know how. I didn't know that, oh, it's, this isn't going to hit me right away. It actually takes 15, 20 minutes. But so I, by the time I felt super drunk, I was like, oh, no, those last two drinks are going to hit me. Oh, even same. Uh, yeah. I was very, my, my household, it was like very frowned upon. Like, so that, like even, uh, you know, even any of my parents' friends or nobody in, in our circles even drank really. And so I didn't really have a, a good, healthy relationship when I first got started. I just didn't know what I was doing. Yep. So, I mean, I, I think that is definitely a it's, factor to it's it. It's an interesting substance, alcohol. I mean, it's okay. It's present in the, the one of the most popular, uh, just in terms of numbers, religions in the world, uh, Christianity. Uh, mm -hmm. Wine mm -hmm. is, op uh, you know, in the Bible, didn't Jesus drink wine? Yeah, with, yeah. You know? Well, wine was safer back then than drinking water a lot of times uh, because, uh, you know, dysentery, different things oh, like yeah, you get from point. water. So like to ferment, uh, you know, grapes or, or barley or something else, like, you, you know, uh, you had a lot less likelihood that you're going to get sick from that. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That point. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that does. You're at, if you're, if this is like the Middle Ages and you go over your friend's house, what do you want to drink? Like, oh, that bucket of water over there, <laughs> or the that wine dirty water that yeah. you just washed my feet with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm cows cool. washing himself. Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll go with the wine. I think that's yeah. a little safer. Yeah. It's very interesting. You know, so this now I'm curious about you guys. It's changed how I talk about this to clients. Um, I used to in my early 20s uh, coaching clients. Um, I would tell them like alcohol is the devil if when we're trying to get results. It's yeah. just just it, none, none. Yeah, just avoid it at all costs. If you really care about your results, you got to you got to get rid of it. At least get rid of it for this time period that I'm trying to change your physique. And that's because I did. I, I personally struggled with that. If I I knew that if I was drinking or going out on the weekends and partying and stuff like that, I just didn't. I saw little to no progress in my own physique. Mm -hmm. If I had clients that uh, were following a regimen, you know, and they were consuming alcohol on the weekends, it was just enough for us to to, to stall our progress. And so I, I avoided it like the plague early on. Now that's kind of changed for me uh, later on in life. I've learned balance and I have a better understanding of the metabolism and you know what other factors were going into play. Because for me. Many times I thought like that was the main problem, right? So I was unfamiliar with how I could have somebody that was, you know, 50 to 100 pounds overweight and then only be eating 1,300 calories. I, I didn't know that was possible. And then when you drink four or 500 calories or 700 calories on the weekend, and that's 50% of what your daily intake can be, you know, on a regular day, it can be stifling to drink alcohol. Yeah. So I'm, uh, same uh, pattern as you. Uh, when I started as a trainer, my understanding of health was very small. And what I mean by that was, th it's, it was like the scope was small, right? It was like a magnifying glass on one aspect of health, which was get lean, build muscle, perform in the gym. If that's all health is, if all health is, is muscle fat uh, and performance, then yes, alcohol is is a waste. Don't, don't mm -hmm. drink it because it's not going to contribute uh, to any of that. But the problem is that's not what health is. Health is much bigger than that. Health includes relationships. It includes enjoying yourself in the moment. It includes 
uh, good feelings uh, includes palatability of things. Celebration. You know, for the sake of them, right? So yeah. like, you know, drinking or eating something just for the sake of the enjoyment of it is all can also in a healthy way contribute to positive health. And so once I was a trainer for a while, I realized that, okay, um, if they're, they're asking me this question because they find value. And again, I'm not talking about dysfunctional drinkers. It's totally different. I'm talking about like people who are healthy. They're asking me this question because they find value in the wine, whether it be, you know, at the end of the night, my wife and I unwind with a glass of wine and we connect or, you know, Sunday dinner, you know, at my grandma's house, you know, we, we have a little bit of wine together and we hang out or I like to do the occasional wine drinking with my friends and whatever. In those cases, uh, can they can be contributing to positive health? Absolutely. I've experienced it. I've experienced sitting at a table with a friend or family member uh, and, you know, having a little bit of wine, the wine, you know, loosens you up a little bit. You have conversations and then they get deep and it's really great. And, and, you know, although the wine gave me extra calories or the alcohol gave me extra calories, it was totally worth the trade-off. So my conversation totally changed. It changed from no, don't have it to, okay, uh, there's value in it. Let's talk about how to, uh, how to use it in a way that's appropriate, but also let's talk about ways to mitigate the negative physical effects, right. which mm -hmm. are the fat gain and the, the performance loss and all that kind of now, stuff. Now, I think this is a very fine dance, though, because yes. what comes with this is is a level of self-awareness that the client needs to have. Totally. Because there is that, that you know, at what point does something that is is part of the balance in your life and, and giving you fulfillment and joy and you're using it for social reasons or those all those that you listed off and then at what point are you using it to distract you from being present yes mm. and so i drink at night because i hate my kids all right uh, that's not really well good, i mean that's like it. flat out admitting it some people just say like oh i just really like to have a, a glass of wine or two every single night and it's like okay well what's what drives you to to do that every single right. single night you know and their their thought process oh i needed to decompress you know, I have a str I have I have a very stressful right. type of job, so I need to do that. So I'm so now you're telling me as a as a trainer that you have high stress levels, and then you choose at nighttime to medicate to medicate right. with alcohol. That we've got to we've got to we've got to definitely get a hold of that because There's healthier ways to do that. Hundred percent, and mm -hmm. we're not and we're not going to get to your fitness goals while also doing that. Right. So there's two things we can talk about. One is the occasional, you know, drinking. And then the other is drinking when you're quote unquote partying, both of which I think have can have some value. The occasional drinking can have some value. Um, and then the even more occasional, uh, dare I say rare occasions where you party, I think can also have some value. I mean, obviously, you know, we've all gone off and partied and have a, and, and, and drank more than just you know one drink or whatever and found value in it. So I think there's two things that we should communicate to. Speaking to the, the party aspect, this is something I learned a little bit later as an adult. Uh, as, a, as a kid in my 20s, usually it, I didn't party a lot. I was really focused on you know working out. But when I did, it was always you know, we would start at 11 o'clock at night and we'd go throughout the night and then, you know, I'd go to bed at 4 or 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the next day was ruined and then the day after was kind of ruined as well. Later on, and I, I'm trying to think of the first time this happened. I think I went uh, with my, guess what I did? I went with my cousin. It was a Saturday and it was uh, like afternoon and we drank during the day. Um, and that night we stopped, we stopped like around 5 or 6 p.m., and by the time it was time to go to bed, 10, 11 o'clock, I'd sobered up. Mm -hmm. I slept okay. I woke up the next day and I felt better. And I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, it's, it's I, The reason why I felt so shitty before, yes, I had alcohol. It's also because I didn't sleep. Yeah. Maybe I should do this. If I'm going to do it, do it during the day so at least I could sleep at night. made a huge difference. That's one of the biggest factors I've found is the sleep factor, right? Like, like staying up till 3 in the morning. Uh, and, and again, this is one of those old uh, sort of uh, wisdom things where anything past like midnight or whatever, usually you're not going to make good decisions. <laughs> yeah. and so, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely, if I'm going to, 
uh, now I think uh, obviously more, uh, I, you know, I'm older now and, and, and Courtney and myself too, like we still uh, like to have, you know, beverages every now and then, but it's, it's, we're definitely more prone, like prone to doing it during the day or like near the pool or something that's like, um, you know, a little bit more uh, reasonable on that where we're not going to be affected by sleep. Well, th this speaks to why alcohol can be so bad for your fitness goals other than just calories. People think it's just empty calories. Mm -hmm. So it's not just empty calories. In fact, you could argue that the, the sleep, you know, th that you get because of alcohol or the lack of good sleep that you get or quality sleep that you get because of alcohol is as bad or if not worse than the actual few hundred calories that it costs to have it. Now, I'm going to I'm going to make a comparison here and I got to speak very carefully because I'm not trying to say, you know, one is okay, one isn't whatever, but I'll tell you what right now. If I drank during the day enough to get me a a a comfortable appropriate buzz or even drunk, not like overdoing, it. I'm not throwing up, not sick, I, you know, I'm not stumbling, but enough to where it's responsible, I'm having a good time. And then I go to bed that night and get good sleep. And I compare that to no drinking at all, but losing a total night of sleep. I'm going to feel worse the day after the to the loss of, of night of sleep. That's right. Than I would from drinking and getting decent sleep. Yes. The lack of sleep would make me feel especially much worse. if you accounted for those additional calories in your diet earlier in the day. Right. So if you if you knew you were going to have four or five beers, which you know equates to you know depending on what kind of beer you're drinking, seven hundred or so calories, seven to nine hundred calories, and you modify your diet, you had it earlier, and you then you get to sleep. That person, I could argue, may may actually not be as affected as the person who has terrible sleep. They totally. ate the same amount of calories, but then has terrible sleep and then goes to bed. That so that's a huge part of what makes it. And then it also promotes this this uh, appetite. Like you guys remember as a kid, like I remember, mm. you know, this. I think Jack in the Box became famous for this because mm -hmm. they were like the first fast food restaurant that I remember yeah. staying open beyond 2 a.m. Oh, you imagine they if targeted they had, drunk people and stoners. They yeah. did. They, you imagine if they had a breathalyzer at the at the Jack in the Box oh, right yeah. here in the middle of that. Yeah. Everybody would be arrested. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we can't. Yeah. I mean, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant because nobody was catering to that market and that was, there was a, that was a massive market at that time. Yeah, so Alcohol yeah. does something very interesting, okay? So let's think about this for a second. Think about some of the dumbest, stupidest decisions you ever made in your life, and alcohol probably played a role in some of these decisions. And I don't mean just, I mean, across the board, either you slept with someone that no way in hell you would normally sleep with, or maybe you didn't use protection, or you made a dumb decision with your buddies and you thought, oh, this is going to be funny. I'm going to see if I could, you know... You, kick my foot through the wall right. or jump off the roof Destroy into the pool things. or whatever. It's because alcohol has a very powerful uh, disinhibiting effect on the brain. It actually, the way it affects the brain is it completely reduces or, you know, in some cases eliminates inhibitions. So if you're somebody that's normally like, shy yeah. and you're like oh man i don't you know and then you drink next thing you know you're drunk and you're 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 flashing yeah. people at the yeah. bar it's like a superpower for them yes or you know you're you're like oh no i would never just have sex with someone i just met in one night let alone do it without protection and then you're drunk and then you wake up the next day like oh my gosh what did i do i made some stupid decisions okay so that all happens here's another part that that you lose your inhibitions with your diet Normally, mm -hmm. you might have a craving for you know French fries and a cheeseburger, uh, but you'd be like, ah, "Man, that'll that'll mess up my stomach. I'm not gonna eat that right now. It's midnight." But now you're drunk. Inhibitions are gone. I don't care. I don't care if I get diarrhea for two days or or, or whatever. <laughs> I'm gonna eat that disgusting you know whatever food. It's just delicious. So your decision making process goes out the window. So what I used to tell my clients was, "Here's what we need to worry about. Okay, if you're gonna drink, have your meals planned out." for yourself because that's where people really screw up the most. You can add up all the calories from the drinks. It usually doesn't even come close to the calories that they have from the food mm -hmm. that comes along with the drinks. Oh, and that was a game changer for me and my Well, clients. especially when you, and I remember when this, I, I pieced this together. So have you ever noticed after a, a heavy night of drinking, the next morning, sometimes you look leaner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> dehydrated and you're yeah. deep because it dehydrates the shit out of you especially when you had a lot of alcohol like that and so psychologically 
what happens to a lot of clients and myself when during this time when I didn't understand this, I wake up and I'm like, oh shit, mm. I had all that partying and fun <laughs> last night and I still look good. Yeah, it so, you. so it tricks you Unless into thinking, whole pizza. Yes. And then you're like, <laughs> I'm going to go eat that pizza or I'm going to go get those 20 tacos from Jack in the Box, you know, for eight bucks or whatever. So you got to watch out for that too. And that then that just snowballs. And before you know it, it all catches up to you. It yeah, does. It's interesting though to talk about. So that, this is mainly the people that are, are prone to, to, to partying, but uh, the ones that like have it occasionally, like consistently with uh, dinners and, uh, you know, and it shows up uh, continuously. It's interesting because I've had clients that have done this, but also did struggle a bit with their sleep still. And, and yes. noticeably when they uh, took alcohol out completely, like their sleep improved uh, tremendously. So, so I just was having a conversation with a client of mine uh, and she has the aura ring. And we were actually like testing out all this. Sleep is like one of her things. She's got all the sleep aids. She's got everything, right? She's got the the Uller. She's got the Felix Grey glasses. She's got the Ned. She's got she's got all these tools to like help her sleep, right? And ever occasionally she likes to drink on Friday nights with her, her girlfriends. And she just has a couple. She's not a big heavy drinker or anything. And we've been like comparing like how she sleeps. Now, first of all, Nothing beats like the the all natural route, like doing for quality sleep. Yes, like yeah. using like like Nuller is a natural thing for just cooling the bed down. Right, you're not taking anything, you're not taking in anything into your system. So using tools like that or Felix Grey to calm her down, and then not using any sort of pills like you know Tylenol PM or anything. Nothing gives her better quality sleep than just doing that stuff, being mindful of the sun going down and, and tech and stuff like that, making sure the room is cool by the, using tools like that. Uh, the Ned Sleep Aid, aid uh, uh, Tylenol PM, um, any of the, and then if she drinks, and nothing is worse than drinking. So if she drinks, and just like two drinks, it doesn't need to be you know, five, six, seven drinks. She has one or two drinks. That's the worst sleep she'll get, no, no matter what, how she feels too. That's the thing that, that throws people off is they think like, they might have slept hard, you know, or they wake up and they or they slept long. And so they think they got really good quality sleep. But then when you use like a tool like the Aura Ring, you can actually see the quality of it and it's just restless. And even though they might have felt that way, and she'll tell me, she'll be like, you know, it's mm -hmm. crazy, Adam. I didn't think my sleep was that bad. But when we keep going back and we're checking this, it's consistently, anytime I drink, it throws it off the It most. does. Mm -hmm. and, and it's there's a lot of things that happen in sleep. You don't just become unconscious. It, it, you know, if, <laughs> if that was it, look, uh, medicine, modern medicine would have solved insomnia. It would be solved. There'd be no problem. Oh, insomnia, easy cure. Take this pill, you're out, and you'll wake up the next day. Doesn't work that way. A lot of things happen when you sleep. And anything that alters you um, can make – now, of course, there's a there's a risk versus reward, right? If you just can't get to sleep, then taking something that helps you fall asleep, even though the quality is a little bit less uh, or you know not as good, still better than not sleeping at all. Right. But if you take – if you can sleep and then you drink alcohol, you're like, oh, it knocks me out, your sleep is not going to be uh, as good. This is, again, it goes back to, you know, don't drink – you probably want to sober up before it's time to go to bed. I remember when I would tell clients this and they I'd, I'd sell them on it. And they do it, but like, man, that's way different. It's way different. If I have a drink right before I go to bed, even if it's one, versus if I have it, you know, four hours before I go to bed, uh, big yeah, difference. Stark difference. Big, big difference. Well, I remember that hack difference. that you, uh, I mean, we talked about this early on in the podcast that you introduced, I think, Justin and I to, which was, and I never had this this habit of doing this before. Before I was the typical person who I think drinks, you know, too many drinks and then, you know, goes to bed and, and, and sleeps, tries to sleep it off, right? Um, by having the charcoal at the end of the night and then like chugging like as much water as I could before I went to bed made like a night and day difference mm -hmm. on how I felt the next day. That was a huge hack. Yeah, so that's a so that's a good one. So, uh, you know, I, and this is just success I've had with clients is to have them have kind of hard set rules where it's like, okay, if you're going to go out with your friends – uh, for every alcoholic drink, make sure you have uh, water in between. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that serves two things. One is it, of course, make sure you're hydrated because if you're dehydrated on top of recovering from drinking and losing sleep, oh, you're going to feel terrible the next day. So, it's, so right. you know, find your drink. Let's at least make sure you're not dehydrated uh, or, or you get at least enough fluids. But it also does this. It paces you. Yes. If you're drinking and you know drinking alcohol and then drinking water and then drinking alcohol, speed is a factor. It's a massive factor. Like I mean, this is too why I avoid shots like the plague now. You know, like growing up and you know that was like sort of bragging thing where we're doing shots. But um, it, 
the thing is, once you drink super fast, like it, it won't hit you initially, but then once it hits you, now all of a sudden, like you're, it just overwhelms your system, and and now you're not going to receive like the beneficial part of you know the feelings of of you know like an elevated mood or feeling more social or all these things. You just go straight to the darkness. Well, it's not just that; it's also what it does to your blood sugar. So, like when you drink fast and rapid like that, and you don't break it up with the water, you have a massive spike to the blood sugar. Mm. And part of the hangover headache and all the shitty feeling that we feel the next day is actually it's the it's the dramatic drop that your body goes through. It's because it spikes so high blood sugar wise, and then it's the crash, and it's that it's that discrepancy right there that makes you feel so terrible. Mm. By you adding in water in between like that, you mitigate how bad that that drop off is. It can also that can also stimulate appetite as well. Blood sugar dro- uh, spikes and then drops, and now you're triggered to eat something mm-hmm. that's going to raise blood sugar. Which usually looks like something starchy, uh, and which, fast, and oh, fast, yeah. right? So, I mean, French fries, pizza, like those are the best, you know, foods to have when you're when you're drinking. But yeah, that that pacing makes it. You know, it's funny. We talk about uh, you were talking about when you were younger, you know, taking shots. One of the easiest ways to tell, besides looking at someone, right, is whether or not they're a older drinker or a younger drinker, is just how fast they're drinking. Yeah, an older, more experienced drinker. Enjoys the drink, sips on yeah, it. The younger sippers. Yeah, the younger person is just. I want to get smashed. How fast yeah. can I get there? Let's do these shots real quick. How many quick. Long Island's can I slam? Yeah, and yeah. then you're you know totally different. Like that's what I would do when I was younger too. Now as I'm older, it's like I'm sipping and enjoying my drink, and I think that makes a big difference. Like overall, don't overdo it. I think overdoing it uh, is the worst possible thing you can do. And you get you get less of the positive and way more of the negative. Well, that's mm-hmm. where this goes right. That's very similar to the advice that we give with eating, right? So, you know, by no means do any of us believe that you should have chicken and broccoli and rice for your own right. meals, and that you know, part of enjoying a piece of cake on a birthday and stuff like that is also part of health. It's not the piece of cake that's going to make you fat either. It's the overindulgence of mm-hmm. that. It's right. the going back for the second slice, the third slice, yeah. you know, and eating it the next two to three it's days. Open in up row. the floodgates, you know, instead of just like being like modern about it and just like having the enjoying the taste of it and slowing yourself down but also being able to be somewhat reserved about it yeah now, totally what about things with diet now do you guys uh let's say it's it's friday nights coming up and you know you we we've planned all of us we're getting away we're gonna have some drinks we're gonna enjoy ourselves mm-hmm. um will you eat differently leading up to that that night i'll eat i'll eat uh make sure i have good protein mm-hmm. and fats and i'll reduce my carbs because the carbs are going to come from the alcohol and i'll tell this to clients too uh it, you know if you want to drink a little bit and not have the excess calories turn into body fat or whatever then the trade is typically the carbs not mm-hmm. the definitely not the proteins and probably not the fats. Yeah, it's going to be the carbs because you're going to get them again. A glass of wine is going to have carbs. Alcohol turns into that uh, as well. And I don't know of any protein alcoholic beverages, or definitely not any that are you know <laughs> yeah. that are that are fat. Yeah. And so that's typically what I'll do. And that way, so if you're going to have, let's say you have a drink every night, and your drink is you know I don't know 170 calories or 150 calories, you could theoretically, and this isn't ideal physically, but it is a again a way to mitigate. You could cut a hundred and fifty calories worth of carbohydrates in the day, have the hundred and fifty calories from your alcoholic drink that you have at night or whatever, and calorie wise you'll be at a wash. Calorie wise you'll be okay, and you won't be in that you know in one hundred fifty calorie uh, surplus. And I know it's more of an advanced move, uh, and you sort of work your way towards not having to have training wheels. I mean, I've done the same thing with coffee too. You see how Starbucks has basically like turned everything into a milkshake, yeah. uh, you know, before you actually feel the effects of the caffeine. Um, but I mean, alcohol is no different. Uh, you know, there's a lot of drinks that people may not typically like the flavor of alcohol. And so they'll, they'll add like whatever, like sugary soda or whatever type of, uh, you know, mojito or, or daiquiri or, you know, some of these like real mm, sugary good. drinks, which are great. Uh, but also like, uh, I mean, it, so many excess calories and so many things to consider with that. Whereas, you know, I've moved on to, uh, you know, a rocks glass and I'm sipping on something like straight, uh, you know, whiskey or, or straight, uh, some kind of straight spirit uh, where, you know, you go nice and slow, you get the same effects, but yeah, it is a little bit more of a mature approach. Yeah. It's uh, w- and you feel way worse when you have a sh- alcohol and a shit ton of sugar. That's the, next so that's the thing. Way yeah. worse. And a lot of drinks, if you look at them, you get these mixed drinks 
and it's got one shot of vodka in it. And I don't know, how many calories does a shot of vodka have, Doug? Maybe you could look that about up. About 110. Yeah, it's not much, right? Yeah. But the drink has got like 300 calories because it's blended with you know uh, simple sh- syrups and sugars and mm-hmm. fruit or whatever, and it's this drink and... You know, and then you have three of them, so you have your three shots of vodka. But the reality is, you had a thousand calories worth of, of sugar, and it goes it. down so smoothly that uh, you're you're more uh, you know moved to have another one. It's it's very easy to uh, to add more in than you would if it's like uh, it's got a little bit of uh, reserve to to drink it that fast. Well, then yeah. you also, I mean, you, the blood sugar point that I made too. I mean, you oh, add way a, worse. Yeah, you add a bunch of sugar to that. That that's going to make that spike and crash even harder. So, totally, yeah. and you know, it's funny when you're younger. Uh, that's what you want is the sugar. In fact, because it makes people drink more. Mm-hmm. So you have a party and you're like, let's make, you know, whatever they call it, Gorilla Juice. Jungle or Juice. Or yeah, whatever. there you go. And it's a bunch. And really it's because you you when you're younger, you just, you don't like the taste. And so you're just going to drink to get drunk or whatever. Um, and speaking of alcohols, um, types, you know, I, I dare I say the healthiest, I guess I'll say the lowest calories or the ones that you can drink that will probably have maybe the least, as long as it's drunk, done appropriately, least physical negative effects. Uh, vodka has got to be at the top, right? It's mm-hmm. a pretty clean, low calorie alcohol. Um, luckily it goes with almost anything. Um, and, uh, you can get gluten-free, uh, varieties of, of vodka. That's my choice. If, I, when I, if, and when I go drinking, which isn't very often, um, this, and, and you can look at the different alcohols this way. Wine tends to have a little bit more calories as a straight alcohol. By the way, wine, in my experience, especially the darker ones, tend to produce more of those hangovers uh, the, uh, the day after. Me I don't hangovers. think there's that. I actually don't think there's as much difference as you think when you're drinking like pretty straight stuff. Like everything from uh, wine to beer to hard alcohol, if it's not mixed with anything else, I think I'm pretty sure the calories fall between that like 95 to 120 range. For the same volume. Or yeah, for, this, for one ounce. One ounce to one ounce. Now, that when you bring up things like wine, the thing I think of right away is – you know, nobody, glass. yeah, nobody pours a four ounce oh, glass yeah. of wine. And when you read like, oh, how many, how many ounces? They pour a goblet. Yes. Yeah, that's like six glasses. Yes. Or yes. Like, yeah. yes. And then you also like it with cheese and crackers and other things like that. And so, you know, to me, it's the, 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 the two things that I think that I've, I've had the greatest challenge as a trainer with, with coaching people through this is the, the psychological piece and the behavior piece that goes with it. Totally. Mm-hmm. It, Always. Yeah. It's the, I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually naive to the fact that I'm using this to medicate. I'm really not it's not enhancing my my life or i have other bad behaviors that are attached to this and i'm also unaware of that mm-hmm. that is way more detrimental than the actual calorie counting of like oh this is better because mm-hmm. although that's what everybody wants to know everybody wants to tell me like okay i'm gonna go drinking what's the best drink that i should have so i don't get fat the next day i can't tell you how many times like i've been over this with uh, certain clients that would uh just tell me they had one glass or they had two glasses and then we would i find Finally, would call them out. And we'd look and see like what kind of glass it was, and it was just astonishing to me. Uh, you know what they considered a glass, and 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 honestly, they didn't even like think uh, anything of it, like and didn't uh, associate that with the serving size. Uh, so it it was somewhat of honesty on their part, but again, they weren't aware that uh, you know that really wasn't uh, considered a glass. That was <laughs> yeah. considered like three glasses. That's like it's like that old joke. Like I'll just take one slice of pizza. Don't cut it though. Just make it all one. <laughs> Life. Now, yeah, Justin, I'm, gonna, I'm yeah. curious about you because of all of us, I think you would admit that you probably like alcohol more than anyone. I think Sal and I don't drink hardly no. at all, really. Although yeah. l- lately, I have since the introduction of Zbiotic. But I, I, I want to know from you, knowing the the psychological stuff and the behavior stuff that can be attached to it, do you have rules that you've gave yourself, like, the, do, or that you say, like, okay, this is how I keep myself in check because I do, admittedly, like alcohol, enjoy a glass of scotch every once in a while. Yeah. What are, what are your rules? Well, again, to to the behavioral part of it, uh, if I notice that uh, I'm feeling stressed out and uh, and then I'm I'm drawn to to drink, like I, I try to check myself on that, like. I don't want to drink because I'm stressed out. Uh, I don't want to rely on that as being something that I'm medicating. Like I want to, I want to drink and enjoy drinking to be more social and have that uh, as interaction time with me and my wife or, you know, with my friends or I have that as like a more of a uh, something that I look forward to. It's, it's not very, 
uh, it's not something that I'm like introducing a lot as a lifestyle thing. It's something more that I'm I'm looking at as leisure and recreation. Uh, so the association of it, I had to because I, I would get through spells of that, where especially like last year uh, in particular, like where we're going through a lot of like uh, stuff like uh, leaving because everything's on fire and and uh, you know and like uh, it just seemed like my stress levels were so high that I just I wanted a drink, you know, I wanted to chill out. Out and just you know, and so I had to I had to really start to kind of be more firm with with barriers that I put around it, uh, so I didn't make it uh, a habit. Uh, but I know, like uh, you know, for me, I look at it a little bit differently. I, I do. I do enjoy it, but also um, I'm very I'm very conscious of how often you know I've been drawn to it, and then I'll push back and I'll I'll go away from it for a while. Uh, but I just try to make sure that it's not something that I'm like uh, I'm, I'm reliant on this for something. Yeah, w- whatever you use to help yourself deal with uh, challenging situations starts to become a pattern, and that's what you start to train, and then you start to get good at relying on that whatever it is by the way i say whatever it is because it can be alcohol but it can also be cigarettes uh it could be food very commonly food by the way a lot of people use food to deal with uh feelings which because that's not taboo it's not taboo foods everywhere Mm -hmm. and i'm supposed to eat anyway right so i'm just gonna do it but whatever you do becomes your pattern and then it can become because it's how you deal with stress Here's what ends up happening. You start to use it for hard stress. Then you start to use it for moderate stress. Then you start to use it for daily stress. And it can become a big problem. But it does take a a level of self-awareness. And you have to interrupt that pattern. So you have to say to yourself, I know I want this. It's because I'm really, really stressed out. So I think today I'm going to just deal with that shitty feeling that I have rather than medicating with this, this substance because it's a slippery slope. It definitely becomes a slippery slope. And then you can get caught up in this this pattern that can really harm you um so i'm glad the way you you answered that i think now do you sal did you ever i i just assumed that justin's the only one that's probably put like rules and stuff like that in it and now i know how you we all are right with i'm even this way with caffeine like so right now i'm I'm doing the the mind pump story, uh, and I think last I did it a month ago, right? So the last time I did it, um, I was starting my day off with the pre workout because we've been meeting in the morning to work out. I had been doing that consistently for well over a month now, and so that's so I have like rules just like with alcohol with caffeine. It's like okay, I was getting up to you know three caffeinated drinks, including one of those being a, a pre workout in a day. That's kind of my upper limit. That's kind of where I go. Okay, it's time to come back the other way. And then I have ways of mitigating that or reducing that, right? And one of those is using the Organifi red juice in replace of what would probably be, you know, a caffeinated drink right there. So have you had to do things like that with alcohol or have you coached clients on, on using tools like that? Um, I've coached clients on that. And when it comes to me, I've done that with cannabis. I'm, I'm much more likely uh, to utilize cannabis for you know relaxing purposes or whatever, and my the way that I mitigate it is by dose and by frequency. So I don't I don't go above five milligrams um, when I find that I I'll take five and I don't notice it as much is when I know oh I'm using a little bit too much. Frequency um, you know I'll limit it to a few days a week, not every single day, um, and I feel like you have to have. Here's why it's good to have hard rules sometimes. Because self-awareness is tough, and you're really good at talking yourself out. You're really good at closing yourself. You can sell (laughs) the fuck out of yourself. Oh, no, it's not that bad. Oh, no, this isn't because of bad stress. It's not that bad. No, this is cool. Or you'll just ignore it. It'll be in the background, and you'll just go. But if you have hard rules, like, I already had it three days this week, and I'm going to follow the rule that I made and not have it uh, again, then you're more likely to stay consistent. So I, uh, and that's why I'm asking these questions. I've never had to do this alcohol. It's just, I've actually never liked alcohol. Yeah, it wasn't here. until Z-Biotic would I even, it even indulge the way we have on weekends occasionally. That would just never happen for me. So I've never had to put these, these rules in place. I imagine if I had to, it would look something like, okay, so let's say I'm the guy who's maybe more like Justin where occasionally on the weekend I have a drink or two or whatever. What what would keep what my hard rules would be like that that buzz feeling or that loose relaxed feeling that it takes which you know for me probably is only about two stiff drinks maybe three tops when that becomes four or five right when right. it when it when mm. it takes more to get that same 
feeling of relief, which is the same way I measure cannabis and the same way I measure caffeine, right? That's right, right. I, I'm drinking three caffeinated drinks to give me the same feeling that one caffeinated drink used to give me just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know six months before when I wasn't doing it at all. And so that's where I think this there's a lot of value for clients that really are drawn to having alcohol still in their in their lifestyle somehow because they do really enjoy it is being honest with yourself and saying, okay, the part that you enjoy is probably that kind of relaxed, loose feeling you get after X amount. Whatever that X amount is, understandably, if you haven't had it, for, let's say for months, and I think everybody, just like we do with like a, a diet, right? Where you go and do an elimination diet and then you introduce things. You gotta em eliminate it out of your life for a while, so it's not in there. And then when you introduce it to enjoy it, what is that number that it takes to enjoy it? Mm -hmm. And then give yourself a rule from there that it's like, okay, it used to only take one drink for me to relax. Now I'm up to five. Yeah, I think that number really does help to reveal the frequency, you know, and it's it's very much of a tangible way to look at it. Uh, so that that is something I would pay attention to. How many does it take me to get to that feeling of being relaxed and un uninhibited? Uh, you know, do I need, do I just need one glass or am I up to five? Like you said, like it, that is something that I definitely consider uh, all the time. Yeah, you mentioned Zebaotic and uh, same here. I never, I almost never drank alcohol except when in the rare occasion that I went out with my buddies and then it was just as a social lubricant or whatever to party. It was just a, a means to an end. It wasn't like I got the drink like, oh, I like this. Like, okay, we're, we're going to get drunk. So I'm going to drink this drink and then get drunk or whatever. Um, I, but I didn't like the after effects. Alcohol always, and there's a genetic uh, component, I'm sure. sure. But alcohol always messed up my stomach and it always made me feel like, dog shit the next day. Even if I drank during the day, I still could notice a performance drop and I was so into the gym that if I couldn't have a great workout the next day, it was like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to really go with that. And then, you know, Zbiotics comes out along and uh, it's like crazy. It's, it's, it works like magic. And so now I will have the occasional drink because of it. So it's very similar to you, Adam. I did, if it wasn't for that, I don't, I still think the negative for me, because I value the way I feel, especially with my workout so much, I still think I wouldn't have any. Well, you just nailed something I think is so important too, is that there's such a genetic component to that. Like I, I look at Katrina and it's it's definitely a gene. It's in the family. Like you can see her family yep. and my family, like my family is not drinkers uh, and her family and can be, right? And she's like, we can both, her, she can go drink to drink with me, which I'm like, you know, 100 pounds on her and she mm -hmm. can still go drink for drink with me. And the next day, she gets up, works, works out, and is fine. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I think you, when you have that, that when you have that genetic component that allows you to do that, you've got to be you it's have less to have, pain. You have to have as much more self awareness than other people because you don't get to say like for me, it was very easy. Like you, it was like. I drank and yeah, we had a good time that night, but then man, the next two to three days were just, I was sluggish. I ate terrible workout, suffered, yeah. sleep suffered. Yep. And so it would take really an, a, a seriously very, very important or exciting weekend or moment for me to want to sacrifice the next two to three days of work and working out. And so it was very easy for me not to, I would imagine if I wasn't like that and I was like Katrina, it would take a lot more discipline. Yeah, here's the formula. And again, I'm not going to encourage, uh, be responsible. Don't be stupid um, because nothing I'm about to say will, will protect you if you're stupid. But the formula is uh, lots of water, electrolytes. So have some electrolytes because you want to have this, some of the sodium, some of the magnesium and the potassium to balance you out uh, while you're drinking. Um, Zbiotics before you drink. So what Zbiotics does, is it's got these this bacteria. It's, it's been modified. So it's a patented bacteria that produces a compound that breaks down acetal, uh, acetaldehyde, I think I'm pronouncing it right, which is this like negative byproduct that you get from alcohol, which is responsible for a lot of the shitty feeling. When this builds up in the system, headache, you feel like crap, your gut's off. And so what this does is it, it breaks that down so you don't get that buildup. And then uh, before you go to bed, uh, activated charcoal um, for the gut or uh, an, an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen and you usually will feel the next day way better. And a lot than, of water. In wa yeah, water with the electrolytes. And you'll the next day you'll wake up and you'll feel way better than had you not done all that stuff. Um, and, you know, like, like I've tested this a couple times and it's pretty miraculous. The caveat is this. If you try all that stuff and then you feel great the next day, 
use self-awareness because what it may, might end up happening is you might say to yourself, like what you were talking about with the genetic component is, oh, cool. Now this means yes. I could go hard all the time right? because you're still drinking a lot of alcohol. You're still getting the unhealthy uh, effects of doing all that and the extra calories uh, from all of that. That's right. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so you can come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. The better you get at cardio, the less calories you burn while you do it. Your body gets really good at it. Now, the reason why this is different with resistance training is because the thing that your body's trying to get good at is strength. The side effect of that is the faster metabolism. Through the process of getting stronger, you have the side effect of burning more calories. Now, with cardiovascular activity, you're asking your